humor, like humanitarian work, is about the clash between what is and what could be. Let me illustrate. It may look like times are normal, and they are. It's the new normal, which we used to call bad. Things can change, and change is often gradual until it is abrupt. This cartoon by Bob Mankoff shows exactly how I see our situation. I'm a math geek turned humanitarian worker. It is my job to help understand and address risks using the language of mathematics. Now, I understand that for most of you, that is not your first language, so please bear with me as I share some things with you in a somewhat geeky language. H represents hell. How horrible can things get? D stands for denial. Do we dare admit how dangerous things are becoming? How much velocity of change are we confronting? How much time do we have? Are we willing to take action to help? Very importantly, what the hell were they thinking? Why do we keep socially constructing risk? As a humanitarian worker, I see this everywhere. And I want to point that the original caption by Bob Mankoff was, we've got to talk. Now, this is not talking like me talking at you. This is dialogue. We need a new form of dialogue. What I'm here to share with you is that we keep trying things that don't work. We're honking messages and honking again and again. And guess what? The world is not changing as fast as we need it to change, given the risks we confront. My message to you, my offer to you, is that the emergence of humor enables breakthroughs in how we collectively embark on learning and dialogue. It's made a great difference for me. I hope it can do it for you as well. Now, in order to converse, we need to anticipate what people are thinking, and I hope they're thinking about risk, but maybe they're thinking about something else. <laughs> we need to recognize the reality of what is in other people's minds. Maybe you live in a vibrant city. Science sees darkness coming from beyond the horizon. It may be in the form of a hurricane threatening to hit in a few days. It could be rising sea levels hitting your infrastructure in a few decades. What we know is that like that cartoon in the couch heading for the cliff, everyone, all of us, are going to confront a very difficult and comfortable question. It's about the clash. Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> we laugh, but when you confront that decision, it's not going to be easy, as it won't be easy for this girl in Bangladesh, who, like seven billion of us, is likely going to experience unprecedented threats to water, health, shelter, food security, and so much more. In her village, there used to be big floods every four to seven years. And when the big flood happened, the chickens died, and people didn't have eggs or meat, and they went hungry, depending on food aid. They could manage, but now those big floods are happening more and more frequently. We were uh, seeing the need for community workshops. And in one of these workshops, one of the women came up with an elegant idea. How about if we substitute the chickens with ducks? The water rise, the duck floats. <laughs> if you had brought this problem to us scientists, we would have come up with mathematical models of chicken flotation, <laughs> maybe a high-tech life vest for the chicks. Why not for the cocks, the senior leadership, some very good executive education program so they can lead us 
out of these disruptive times, maybe through blockchain and big data. The reason why good ideas emerged was partly because humor was part of the design of that dialogue. The conversations were enabling people to feel comfortable, and through humor, creativity emerged. And the ducks may not be a panacea, but they may help, like humor. Now, I'm saying humor. What do you think of when you think of humor? What, what words come to mind? I've asked this many times. Thanks for some of your answers. Some of you may think of comics. Some of you may think of Divina Commedia. Most people think of laughter, jokes, fun, stand-up comedy. Did anyone think death? When I asked this question to the cartoonist, Bob Mankoff, what do you think of when you think of humor? He looked at me in the eyes and said, death. Now, remember his cartoon. He was answering truthfully. The World Bank invited a collaboration between Bob Mankoff, a humorist, and me, a scientist turned humanitarian worker, to help design a dialogue about difficult issues that people usually put their defenses up before having a conversation with candor. What we did was to invite people to walk around the room with many cartoons curated to address the issue in an indirect way. And in looking at those cartoons and writing about it, interesting things happened. Look at those faces. There is smart examination of the offer, and there's enjoyment. There's fun, and that enables a kind of conversation that is different, that is genuine, that is creative, that can lead to solutions about difficult problems. Unlike the typical approach to conversations. How much humor do you think there is in this room? Would you like to come spend 90 minutes? How about a full week? Smart changes is what we need. People, can you give us an idea for smart changes? Look at that fellow over there. <laughs> that fellow is confronting the darkness of too slow a process. Now, I was at this conference, and something peculiar happened. My laptop was not connecting to the internet. So I walk up to the IT desk, and while they're fixing the problem, these two young men, one looks at their own computer, says something in a language I didn't understand, and they both have a big, nice laughter. I have nothing else to do, so I said, would you mind sharing what caused humor? And one of them said, sure, a PowerPoint just started in room 17. I wonder how do you know, and why is that funny? And the answer, a PowerPoint just started in room 17. Exactly. <laughs> now you're beginning to get it. Not everyone. Laughter is the off-gassing of enlightenment. Let me explain. The IT kids noticed that when the PowerPoint presentation started, the audience were being PowerPointed, they tuned out, they started checking email, downloading files. This is catastrophic. We are designing events that seem intentionally created to prevent dialogue. We're creating a swamp between thinking and action. I feel like screaming, I feel like that guy confronting the darkness. Edvard Munch created the scream really embodying that feeling of terrifying fear of the future. And when I see what awaits us as humans, there are many dark forces coming. So I and many of us need lightness, need light to reinvigorate, to keep going. However, sometimes we receive bad forms of humor. Ross Chast captured this very well in her book, What I Hate. I don't want bad jokes that offend. I don't want icebreakers that make people gag. What I'm talking about is not that. 
When talking about harnessing humor for humanitarian work, what I'm talking is to harness the superpowers of what we're capable to do, what we're capable of doing, when we experience fun that is functional for managing risks. Let me share with you three examples briefly. Working in Southern Africa, instead of the usual dry workshop to address flooding risk, we run a game where people had to confront the risk of flooding and if certain things happen, roll a die, etc., they had to run, get it done. Look at the body language. Those ladies are really running for it. But if you look at their smiles, look at those faces, they're radiant. Humor was in the air. Neuroscience shows that when humor happens, memories go deeper, they're easier to recollect, they stay longer. This is very important to me. When humor happens, it engenders trust between people or between people and ideas. And change, the changes we need happen at the speed of trust. Think of how much more you can accomplish when you trust who you're with or when you trust the ideas you're with. Humor can help. Not only in uh, rural Africa, also in the White House. I was invited to give a five-minute presentation. I was one of many. My turn was after. Uh, lunch. This was about eight years ago. I knew the brains would be dead, so I said, hello, my name is Pablo from the Red Cross, and this is not a frisbee, it's a hurricane. <laughs> and then I explained the science of hurricane forecasts in an unconventional way, and it worked. People stayed with the concepts, people got it, people wanted to talk with me afterwards. Like to you the mathematics of humor forecasting or climate change, humor is strange. And that's good for us. Because humor is strange, it can help us turn the strange into something familiar, like science. Or the familiar but unacceptable into something strange. Why is that? Why do we accept that? Last example. My team was training NASA scientists on how to communicate their awesome satellite tools to disaster managers. And when we arrived to the venue, we saw that it had the, the feel of a stand-up comedy. So my colleague Andrew said, why don't we take advantage of this? And we invited participants, scientists, to form small groups and create good headlines about bad things that could happen and could be avoided. And they came up with very interesting things. Many were humorous. They came to the front of the microphone, and they read them, and humor emerged. And with that, with laughter, came very good listening and very good reflection. I'm not talking about joking, a provocation that aims to create laughter. I'm talking about participatory humor, when you invite people to inhabit that sense of joy. Laughter can be the shortest distance between people and ideas. I won't read the quote, but when we are coached, the TED guidelines for speakers advise that if the audience laughs with you, they like you, and then they take more seriously what you have to say. Martin Luther King said that creative laughter is necessary in times of tension. He and Gandhi were tactical users of humor. No one can tell me that their job was not serious. So this is what we normally think about humor. But professional humorists who we need to make this work happen, they think very differently. These are the words that they think of when they think of humor. Risk, tension, conflict, incongruity, ambiguity. Things that are problematic, death. Without these things, there's no humor. And these things are all over the world. That's why we humanitarians have way more work than we can manage. This is why humor helps us understand and address risks. My last slide. Why humor and risks? It is my offer that if carefully created, humor can help you. Humor can help us. First, by creating a, a gentle puzzle, a sense of confusion. Make people notice that 
there's something funny about the system. Ma come? Huh? After that moment of confusion, laughter may emerge. Haha, <laughs> you, you laugh, but then you also recognize that it's different from that room with the conference, which looked like death by PowerPoint. Death by PowerPoint followed by hell. Dante's Inferno. Lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate. See, abandon all hope, those of you who enter. We need to create new spaces. If there's laughter, there's recognition of something true, an emotional truth, that then makes people say, hmm, wait a second, this is exactly like our world. Try honking again. And that leads to the, aha, I get it. The system is flawed. It is true that we can do something about it. Let's do it. As a humanitarian worker, I see all this darkness. Humor is helping me do more. And it's also really helping me coexist with the darkest. And, and I make the darkness, not the darkness, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>